Well, let's get started. It's, oh, I'm one minute slow. So we are recording. I just want to introduce Tim Dungan. He is a graduate student here in the department. I will let him give you his life details. It's all yours, Tim. Okay, great. Thanks, Terry. So welcome this evening. Welcome to everybody that's in Lincoln, as well as um, everybody that's calling in from all over the state. Um, it seems as though we had spring in our grasp, but now it's gone. So uh, this is a timely topic for this evening's season extension. So uh, I want to click through my slides here. There we go. And perhaps uh, I want to probe the depths of your memory, and perhaps you'll remember this. If I can get to full screen somehow. Sorry for the ad. Hey, Tim, there's nothing there. Okay, so let's uh, close that. Um, I want to go back to my to Stop sharing this screen. So hit stop share. Right there. Yep. And then you'll have to share the screen that you want showing. Oh, okay. So I want to go to here. No. Sorry. Share that screen. I want to share this screen. Hit share. There you go. There we go. And then I want to maximize. Where's the maximize? Oh, there it is right there. Got it. There we go. Okay. It's hard to find good help these days. All right, so uh, my hope and intent tonight is to give you something that will help you fool Mother Nature in your backyard just a little bit, maybe in the spring, maybe in the fall, but give you some information that you can use uh, to extend your season just a little bit. So the philosophical question for tonight is who am I and why am I here? If you're a um, fan of Hitchhiker of the Galaxy, I believe the answer is 42. Um, so I am Tim Dungan, as Terry said. Um, I am married to the lovely and talented Mitzi. Uh, we have two kids, two boys, Charles and Nicholas. One's a junior, one's a sophomore at Lincoln Northeast. Um, I am a lifelong gardener and a dedicated season extender. Um, I am a UNL Extension Master Gardener. And I uh, am pursuing a master's degree here at UNL in horticulture with a minor in entomology. I came to school after a 27-year career in pharmaceutical R&D here in Lincoln at Dorsey, Sandoz, Novartis, GSK, whatever it's called these days. Um, so if you're familiar with the products like Theraflu, Triaminic, Excedrin, Benefiber, those are some products that I worked on in my previous career. Um, my interest in coming back to school is to find a second career and perhaps extension education, ex extension education, excuse me, um, integrated pest management, uh, landscape management, not so much design, but um, how do I take care of my plants once they're in the ground? Um, how do I deal with disease? How do I deal with turf? Things like that that are more, I suppose, the, the educational side as opposed to the design side. Um, so this kind of training is the type of training that I want to do. And I will leave it up to you at the end of the evening to determine if I should continue pursuing it or not. So uh, that's enough about me. Let's move on for the evening. So we're going to talk about season extension. Um, this is the first time that I've presented a seminar of this length, of this topic. I've presented a micro piece of this seminar last spring. It was about six or seven slides long, and it lasted about 20 minutes. So my fear is that I'm probably going to be a little bit short or a little bit boring or some combination of those. So um, I hope I've got enough information to fill up the evening. Um, and I hope that you will have learned something by the end. If not, Terry can fire me, and then we can, you can find someone else next springtime, okay? So a little bit about what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what is season extension? What are we trying to accomplish? We're going to talk about the relationship between germination and soil temperature, which is key for season extension in the spring. 
we're going to talk a little bit about plants. I know you had a talk two weeks ago about gardening with John Porter. Um, so I'm not going to expand a whole lot on that, but it is part of the plan. It is part of success. And we will talk generally about some spring approaches and some fall approaches, some planning approaches. And then we will talk about in the second half after our break, we'll talk about some of the tools and techniques that you can use in your garden. So let's start with the definition. Season extension, and this comes right from Wikipedia, so I cheated, um, refers to a farming or gardening technique that allows a crop to be cultivated beyond its normal outdoor growing season or harvest window. So it seems pretty self-explanatory. We're extending a season, and you could almost call it jump-starting a season in the spring and extending it in the fall. Um, and we, we tend to think, uh, you'll notice the word crop there, so we tend to think of season extension as vegetables. Um, but you, know, you can use the techniques to get your flowers started earlier, to make your flowers last longer, and certainly in some aspects of the industry, I mean, cut flowers are provided through season extension te techniques. There's a greenhouse somewhere or a high hoop, a hoop house somewhere that's growing cut flowers. So what does it look like in a practical sense? Um, certainly you've been to the farmer's markets in Lincoln or many of the towns that uh, nearby where people are listening this evening. You've been to the farmer's markets early in the springtime. Here in Lincoln, they start about the first week of May. And certainly when you go to those farmer's markets, you're gonna find somebody that's selling produce. And so how did they get that produce? Well, you can be sure that they use some kind of season extension technique to grow that produce. Um, sorry, lost my spot already. So there's probably two different approaches. There's the commercial approach, a very large scale approach. And we'll talk about that just a little bit because it, it morphs into greenhouses, work, work, which is not really where I wanna go this evening, but it, by definition, it's a season extension technique. We'll talk about market gardeners, the people you see at the farmer's market that are using a little bit of a head start in the spring and a little bit of extension into the fall to keep their product on the market in front of you at their vendor stall. And then we'll talk about what you and I can do in our, in our backyard. So what does it look like on a commercial scale? You know, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages? If you think about the largest scale, it's year-round production, year-round income, and depending on where you live, I mean, it, it may be more intense or not. If we get farther south where there's a little more light, it, you may have opportunities to do a little bit more if it's not a complete greenhouse situation. The farther north you go in the winter, lose a little bit of sunlight, and perhaps it's not quite as active. Um, if we look at the seed catalogs or cooking magazines or some other magazines, you'll see that there are niche markets associated with this year-round income approach. Especially if you look in some of the bigger cities, you will find farms whose market is microgreens all year round to high-end restaurants. I mean, that is season extension taken to its, its um, logical conclusion. Uh, conclusion is not the best word, but it is, you have a constant supply and you have a way to provide it. And so that is a, excellent use or a very typical use of season extension. Um, higher prices. Um, you know, people are working a niche market, right? I'm the first one to market with the tomato. I'm the first one to market with this beautiful lettuce. I'm growing these small greens. I'm growing these beautiful beets and I'm there first. And so with season extension, you can get into your market. You can deliver to your customers first from a market perspective, of course, to get a higher price. On the other hand, it may cost more. It may be you've spent more money on fuel or, or lights to, to get your food. Um, higher yields. We have a controlled environment, right? So I'm not out there in the hail. I'm not out there in the cold, not out there in the snow. I'm growing things inside. And so I can get to my finished product sooner. And then you'll even see specific cultivars. So I have cucumbers that are designed to be grown in greenhouses. And you see those in the supermarket now, right? The long English cucumbers that are in the plastic wrap, that is a greenhouse cucumber. Um, you see the, the tomatoes that we have now, and um, you know, I've got on the next slide the statement about better quality, and I suppose it depends on who's evaluating if that tomato 
that you're eating in February is better quality than one you grow in your own backyard. Um, and a couple other points here, you know, if we're in an industry, uh, you know, a larger operation, you've got people that are hired sooner, people that are working later in the year, and then you have customers that know that you can deliver the first tomato. They know that you can deliver the most beautiful microgreens in the market and they're going to come back to you and by word of mouth, you may end up with more customers. So that, I mean, that's really the commercial piece of it. And I've got a couple examples of commercial season extension or greenhouse operations and I know there are many, many more than these dotted all over the state. These are the first couple ones that came to head, my mind. Um, this is Oak Ridge Farms in Ord. And this is a hydroponic lettuce operation. So they've got red and green bib lettuce. Um, they deliver to schools. They deliver to uh, cities in central Nebraska. And you can see 1,000 heads a week in the winter, 2,000 heads a week in the summer. That is from the inside of their greenhouse. I don't see artificial lights. So they're using the native sunlight conditions. And so that would explain part of the reason why they have a drop in production in the wintertime. I mean, they're actually season elimination. They're going year round all the time. So this is season extension, extended 20, 12 months of the year. A better example of what we're gonna talk about tonight would be Pecarix produce in Dwight, about 40 miles northwest of Lincoln or so. So Pecarix is a regular vendor at most of the Lincoln markets, and you will see them there April through December. And if you go to their website, you will see they have a CSA from April through December. Um, familiar, everybody's familiar with what a CSA is, Community Supported Agriculture, where you buy a share. And so you can buy a share of their crops in the spring all the way through the fall. And if they are selling stuff from April through December, that means they started a whole lot earlier than April um, to have that crop. So they are definitely doing season extension. You can see part of their operation there. You have a high tunnel with raised beds covered with row covers. So there's three or four different things going on here for season extension and intensive gardening techniques. Um, so let's start to narrow the funnel a little bit as to what we can do in our own backyard. So the approaches are gonna be the same. We're just gonna scale it down to the backyard. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna try to warm the soil. We're gonna try to protect from spring frost going to try to get earlier production, either as a crop or to get our transplants going sooner. We're going to try to protect from fall frost. We want to extend our production later into the fall. And if you've got some precious perennials or you like to take cuttings and save them for the next year, um, you can even look at overwintering. Depending on what you're trying to overwinter and the techniques you're using, you can use season extension to make those crops or make those plants survive over winter. Um, but you, what you're most important about, uh, most concerned about, of course, as the backyard farmer, is your improved mental well-being, right? You get to get out in your garden sooner in the after, sooner in the season, and you get to stay out there longer. So this weekend was horrible on our mental well-being, right? So it was 70 degrees on Saturday, out in short sleeves, fingers in the dirt, um, and today the fingers will bounce off of the dirt. Um, the other big thing, of course, is neighborhood bragging, right, bragging rights. Um, the first tomato, um, or the first and fresh last green, sorry, first and last fresh green salad um, of the year. I can tell you from experience that it's a lot of fun to put on my jacket, to put on my stocking cap, traipse out to the backyard, to pull the cover off my low tunnel and kind of feel the warmth and humidity on my face, and then cut my salad and take it inside and eat it. So there's a satisfaction that comes with having beaten mother nature even for just a little bit. So we want to extend the season, uh, but what exactly are we up against? We're up against Nebraska's climate, right? So how many of you know which hardiness zone Nebraska is in? See quite a few hands, five, right? Right, at least parts of Nebraska. There's uh, people from all over the states. I'm not sure exactly where everyone is sitting this evening, but we have two different zones in Nebraska. We've got some parts zone four and some parts zone five. So what is um, in your particular area, think about your, your last freeze date. Here in Lincoln, we usually say second week of May, Mother's Day, something like that. Um, first freeze date in the fall, we usually say about the second week of October. And last fall, we were pretty much right on the money for our first fall date here in Lincoln, first freeze date. 
nip some warm season stuff. The basil took it, the coleus took it, a couple leaves of the tomatoes took it, but then it was warm for quite a while. But nevertheless, the first day was pretty much right on target. Who knows what this spring will be like for us. The next question then, of course, is how much variation do you see from year to year? We already had a discussion here in Lincoln this evening that we're about a month behind. We're, although we're right on target theoretically, we're a month behind where we were last year, or, or last year was a month ahead. Okay, so we're all four corners, all four corners, okay. So a little bit of information for you then, I'm gonna go here. This is the climatic zones in the United States. And you can see the different colored zones there. The chart is on the side on your handouts. It's gonna be hard to see. Uh, I've got this link on the very last page, I think, of the production. If you wanted to type that link into your computer at home, this will come up or even just type in hardiness zones, you'll get this map. Um, these boundaries are set by annual minimum temperature. So over X amount of time, someone did a calculation. It said, here's a line where the annual temperature is about the same and they developed these bands. And if you think about it, that's what's important to us, right? We wonder not so much, is it too hot for my plant? Is it too sunny for my plant? But we wonder, wonder is it too cold? Is my plant gonna survive the frost? Is it gonna overwinter? If I plant it in the front yard, is it gonna survive and bloom for next year? So we're worried or we think about minimum temperature more than we think about maximum temperature or, or warm temperature. Um, but if you think about it, in addition to that, you may think about these guys in Florida down there in zone 10 that get to grow just about whatever they want all year round, but you know they have their own issues, right? They may not have to worry about season extension, but they may have to worry about endless generations of insects that um, are ravenous and decide to eat their things. Or I have an uncle that just moved to Florida and he called me one day and he said, why can't I get my tomatoes to grow? Well, he had taken a Northern cultivar that he was used to growing and taken to Florida and tried to grow it. And it was immediately overcome by blight because of constant humidity, constant water. And so he had to you know, learn to garden completely all over again with cultivars that were more adapted to that particular area. So here's the map of Nebraska. And as Terry just said, we have um, people listening tonight from all four corners or all four borders. And you can see the, the edges. We have zone five here at the bottom. We have zone 4B, and this is zone 4A. So you can kind of imagine some of the microclimate that goes on here. We have the Niobrara Valley. We're getting up into the Black Hills. We're getting into the elevations of Wyoming. So you can begin to understand some of the influences of what the climates are, why the low temperature might be lower. And uh, of course, you'll recognize as gardeners that a plant really doesn't care where it's supposed to grow in terms of the number on the label, right? Because you've all planted a zone five plant and it's died, right? So even though your plant is supposed to live here, for whatever reason, the environment that it's in, it may not, it may not like it. So what is our goal? Pretty simple actually, to fool mother nature, we need to make the last frost come a little sooner and earlier in the year, or we make the first frost come a little later, later in the year, right? Pretty straightforward. So how do we change the frost state? What are we trying to do? Well, we're gonna to try to control the flow of heat, which seems uh, perhaps uh, a strange concept, but it's actually pretty simple because we've all done it, right? In October, when Ken Shimmick or whoever your local weatherman says it's gonna frost, what do we do? We go find a blanket, we go find a sheet, we run outside and we cover up our tomato, we cover up our eggplant, we cover up our beautiful flowers that are guarding the front entrance to our house in an effort to try to protect them, right? And so we think we're trying to keep the cold air out when in fact we're trying to keep the warm air that's already in the soil inside that blanket to keep our plants warm. So we're controlling the flow of the heat. What are we doing in the spring? Why, if we put a low tunnel over our garden, what are we doing? We're not trying to keep the cold air out, we're trying to capture a little bit of sunshine in the soil and keep it in there. So we're controlling the flow of heat. It's a little bit of a two-bit word for a one-penny idea. Um, 
so you know think about that think about geothermal systems I know a lot of schools here in Lincoln have installed geothermal systems and what is a geothermal system they take a pipe and they drive it way down into the ground and they capture some of the heat that's in the earth and use it to drive some of the heating in the house or in the in the school sorry um, think about the first snowfall in the fall in the early winter time what happens it falls it hits the ground and it melts why does it melt because there's so much heat left in the ground the snow is not ready to stick yet and at the same storm, why is the bridge icy? The bridge is icy because the wet snow is falling on the ice on this bridge, and the cold air has made that bridge the same temperature as the air, and so the air the, the ice free or the water freezes on the bridge. So I'm going to propose to you that we're going to make we're going to control the flow of heat by making a microclimate. And again, I went to Wikipedia here. Um, so we have a local set of atmospheric conditions that differ from those surrounding, the different from those in the surrounding area, often with a slight difference, but sometimes a significant one. So Wikipedia offered me three sets of words here, all of which I think you can probably determine why they each are a separate microclimate, right? So you have a garden bed. I have something in my backyard, and in my particular backyard, I have a six-foot privacy fence, a whole lot of trees, in south exposure. So that looks like one type of climate for that particular bed versus a large coastal area, right? So I have perhaps an exposed landscape with a whole bunch of water, completely different influence, higher humidity, maybe more winds, a completely different climate. Think about a north facing or south facing, excuse me, north facing or south facing slope. What's the difference? The difference is the amount of sunshine that that slope would get right or a hilltop versus a valley up on a hill down in a valley cold air sinks the cold air is going to run down into the valley so things up on the top are going to be a little bit warmer than those down in the valley so I, I think it's pretty simple to see that um, this picture is just a perfect picture of that definition so this is a picture of a vineyard in the Russian River Valley uh, which is a part of the larger Sonoma Valley, okay? I don't know what particular uh, vineyard this is. I didn't write that part down. But it gives us, in this one picture, just about everything we just talked about. So you can see on the top of the building there, the chateau, the tasting shed, I'm not sure what that is. You can see what appears to be some solar panels or skylights. So you know that the right side of the picture is facing south, right? Um, so if we look at it, what do we see? We see on the north slope, we see that they stopped planting grapes just over the top there. I mean, as soon as they got a little bit down the side on the north, on the north they stopped. It's forest or some kind of shrubland. And you can see that on the, the south side, they, they keep going down. You can see it's still going over here. You can see it looks like it's still down in here. So they're going quite a ways down on the south side. So two different microclimates, right? You have some grapes over here that get a little morning sun or high noon sun, but the rest of the time they're getting shafted just a little bit. They're not getting much. Over here, these guys are all the time, full sunshine. What about right here? You can see a little bit right here, a little bit of a rise. So, you know, that's a little bit of a different microclimate. And I did take from this particular article that this vineyard prizes itself on their microclimate, their terroir. So if you have, if you're a, a wine aficionado and you enjoy tasting the nuances and flavors and aromas of different wines, you can have an appreciation for the differences that microclimate or terroir brings to the wine. And that's exactly what this picture is. And so that's exactly what we're trying um, to capture in our garden. We're trying to get a microclimate that gives us something more. So I'm going to give you a kind of a quick stop. So hold that thought on the microclimate, and then we're going to switch real quick to some of the other pieces. So we've established we need a microclimate, right? And we'll come back to that in a little bit about how we, how we build that. And this is one of the, the, uh, the right turns that happened in my presentation as I was putting it all together. I have a page of notes already of things that I need to change, and this abrupt one was one of them. Um, so let's talk about seeds and transplants. Um, how many of you 
grow your own transplants. I heard some people talking about it just a little bit earlier. I got one, two here in Lincoln, three here in Lincoln. I grow mine. I've got stuff growing in my basement now, and it's a learning curve. For those of you that said I put them outside and they just died, or they get too tall, they get too short, it's a learning curve. So my years, my experiment this year is trying LED grow lights to see if I can make them a little bit shorter, a little bit stockier. So that's this year's experiments. And I've been doing it for how many years? So it's sometimes the learning curve is slower than we'd like it to be. Um, so if you're like me, you've got a stack of seed catalogs quite high already, right? I think I got five of them in the mail yesterday. Some of those are doubles or late spring editions of the early spring editions that I had already received. But nevertheless, the stack is pretty impressive. You've got seeds, you've got vegetables, sorry, you've got vegetables, you have flowers, you have plants, you have trees, fruit trees, nut trees, um, overpriced garden tools, uh, a little bit of everything comes in the catalogs, right? So the choice is overwhelming. And I find myself that I found a couple catalogs that I, they have the variety that I like, and they have a little bit of information. Um, and so I kind of stay with a few, but nevertheless, the stack is large. So the world of horticulture is in your mailbox, right? So they want to bring it to you. All they're asking you to do is click or call them or send it in and they'll bring it right to you. And so we have all kinds of cultivars, all kinds of hybrids. You can have a shorter time to maturity. You can have a longer bearing season. You can have more bearing. You can have hotter peppers and even hotter peppers and peppers that are supposed to be hot that actually aren't hot. Um, cold, heat, drought tolerant, brighter colors, more flowers. I mean, the list is absolutely endless, right? So seeds are a great place to find the kind of variety you're looking for with, with season extension to make your plan a success. Now, some people want to buy their, either want to grow their transplants or they just want to buy them, right? And so you can buy warm season vegetables and flowers, the things that we would normally, you know, multiple kinds of tomatoes, eggplants, uh, cucurbits, um, all of the, you know, the flowers as well. So the marigold, zinnias, amaranths, celosia, all of those. Cool season vegetables and flowers, broccolis, cauliflowers, cabbages. Um, someone else did the hardest part, right? If you're not growing them in your basement or your south window, someone else did the hardest part. They put the seeds in the soil, they watered them, they scooped them out, put them in the bigger pot, fertilized them, delivered them to you, nice and ready to go. But, you know, as we've said, it, it can be done at home. Um, you can find the supplies just about anywhere you need. You, you'd like to go to the garden center, oh, sorry. So here's a, a little comparison between seeds and transplants. And um, this first bullet point here under uh, seeds and uh, on this, this side here, what I meant to say there, if you're going to use seeds for, for a season extension, um, you're pretty much limited to what's gonna sprout now because by the time the soil is warm enough for a warm season crop to sprout, it's probably too late to get started. So th there's a point that needs to be clarified just a little bit. Um, and hardly any annual flowers, you know, annual flowers require warm temperatures to get propagated. Even those that survive in cold temperatures like pansies, they don't germinate until like 70 degrees. So just putting them in the soil now, even with a cover on them, is not gonna get them germinated. So you have some limitations with seeds. Uh, transplants, obviously, you can get those crops started. If you've got them covered up, if you have enough protection, you can get going. Um, we just talked about the wide choice of seeds available in catalogs, probably more so than you can find in retail. I mean, there are pretty big racks in retail stores these days. In catalogs, you can find even more. You, know, you can probably find 10, 12, 15 different varieties of, of different things. I mean, there's a catalog called Totally Tomatoes for Pete's sake. I mean, it's all tomatoes and it's all peppers. So more than you can find at, at the garden center. Um, if you're just going to stay with transplants, you need to recognize that your retail choices might be limited. They're going to have a, they're driven by what will sell, correct? So it's going to be perhaps a certain variety. It may be only hybrids. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able to find the heirloom tomatoes that you might like for flavor and color and shape in a retail setting. You might be able to find it at the farmer's market, but at the local garden center, you're probably not going to be able to find it. Seeds are a little more simple. I can throw them in the ground. I can cover them up, water them. It's going to work. 
transplants, it's a little less simple, only because there's a piece beforehand. Either you have to go to the store and buy it, or you have to grow it yourself. So there's that extra piece up front that comes with transplants. And then of course, transplants are gonna be more expensive than seeds. It's gonna cost you $2.50, $3 for a tomato, where it's gonna cost you $3, $4 for a whole pack of tomato seeds. So there's, a, there's some difference in cost. So let's talk about some specifics for planting or getting going in the spring. Remember we talked about soil temperature. We're trying to warm up the soil. And so why is soil temperature important? We have to have sufficient temperature for seed germination, right? So there is in that seed, you know, a tiny plant embryo and a supply of food for it. And we have to have moisture and we have to have uh, temperature to be able to activate that system to get that plant growing. We may be able to get it going, but we also need the temperatures to keep the plant growing. If we can't keep the plant growing fast enough, then the things that live in the soil, the fungus that live in the soil, and you've heard of damping off or, or uh, um, see, uh, I'm sorry, the name escapes me, but you'll have trouble with seedling success if you're too cold, if your temperatures are too cool. Um, another thing in season extension is so we can use seeds, we have to be careful germination, and then we can get transplants that tend not to like the heat of summer. So some broccolis. Broccoli will bolt, you know, one hot day and broccoli will bolt. You'll go from beautiful green heads to yellow flowers in a day and all your, your effort is gone. So if you can get started earlier, you might have your broccoli before the end of June and, and then you're in good shape. So soil temperature, this is something that we typically measure, typically measure at four inches deep. Why do we measure at four inches deep? Because for Pete's sake, we only plant potatoes at four inches deep. I think the primary reason is it gives us a better picture of the real temperature, of the real amount of heat in the soil. So on a day like Saturday, you have an intense amount of sunshine, or at least for this time of year, a large amount of sunshine coming in, and you would see at the surface pretty warm soil temperatures, but at four inches, there's not a whole lot of change, um, at least not in the moment. Um, so I wanna show you this particular site right here. This is Crop Watch. This is a UNL site. Uh, it's a series of data, uh, of data stations all over uh, Nebraska. So they have a four inch, um, I gotta do what Terry told me and look at it this way. So we have a daily value and they have a weekly average. And as you scroll down here, you can see all of these reporting sites. So I happen to look at the one that's way down here. It's about a mile from my house, which is Walton, which I have no idea why they called it Walton, um, how it got to that name. It used to be called Havelock. So this is the Havelock reporting station at 84th and, and uh, Havelock Avenue. So you can see that today's temperature was the average, the rolling average over the last week was 34. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry guys, everywhere else. Okay, there we go. Oh, now I can't, oh, I got to use the bar this time. Okay, there we go. So here's the, the, um, daily value, here's the weekly value, and it's a little bit hard to see. I mean, you can guess what that place might be, or you can guess what that place might be, but the, the bit real power is down here in the actual data picture. So you can see what the soil temperature is at four inches uh, close to where you live. And if you wanted to, if you're a farmer, you could look at all kinds of other things here. They've got crop information. Um, so there's a whole bunch of fun stuff here, but I usually look at it for the soil temperature. Um, does that make sense? It's pretty easy to look at. I mean, the other way, of course, is to, now see, I'm doing it wrong again. Can't, oh, close tab, no. Okay, so now, okay, we stop sharing that one. We go back to that, okay. Whew. All right, okay. So there's another site, the High Plains Regional Climate Center. Um, but you need an account to get the data from that. Um, so 
So this is what I use to measure the soil temperature in my garden. This is just a compost thermometer. So I made a mark with the Sharpie at four inches and I stick it into the soil at four inches, let it equilibrate to temperature and it reads, um, reads the time. And you can see that was the January 20th in my little greenhouse, the temperature was 32 degrees, right at freezing. And that's, we had, we're solid freezing from before Christmas till almost the beginning of February. So it makes sense. My greenhouse isn't heated, so it makes sense. Um, you could use thermometers you could buy um, in catalogs. You, there may even be other options at some of the garden centers. I tried the meat thermometer, but it, the reading was not, um, it wasn't anywhere close to this reading. I tried to put it in an ice water and test it and it was still five degrees off. So I don't know if it's the way that particular thumb thermometer is designed or that meat probe is designed. So you can try a meat probe if you want, just make sure you clean it off before you stick it in the prime rib. Um, so this is a busy picture, but I wanted to show it to you because this is data from the High Plains Regional Climate Center for last spring. So you can see the dates at the bottom, and these are, you can see the weeks at the bottom all the way from January 1st all the way through the end of June. And you can see how the temperature rose. You can see the variation. So this is at four inches. This would be a high, a high, a daily value at measured at four inches. So what I should have done is massage this data just a little bit for you and probably calculated an average to make the line a little bit smoother. But you can see the amount of variation that you have in a soil temperature over time. But you can also see the trend, right? You can see that over time, we have an increase in temperature up until our first frost date is here in Lincoln is somewhere right in here. So at first frost date, you know, we were in the 60, 62, 65 range for average temperature. And by the end of June, we were at, you know, 75. And really by then, you know, that's the end of planting time. So for most crops, and so that's kind of where I stopped. Now keep in mind, this is four inches deep. So you can imagine what the temperature is at a half inch deep or an inch deep where you've planted some of your seeds. It's gonna be a little bit warmer but this is at four inches deep. So we're gonna come back to this a little bit later. This will be part of your, just a brief assignment for this evening um, to work a little bit with soil temperature. So here's a good picture of soil temperature in seeds. Let's get back to seeds and, so, and germination. Um, I picked this chart because it's a little more colorful. It's basically uh, a repeat of the two other charts that you have. So you should have got three handouts tonight, the soil, um, soil profile or soil temperature profile and then the two charts. One of the charts is temperature, and one of the charts is how many days does it take for a seed to germinate at a certain temperature, okay? So you can see here that um, if I wanted to start beets, carrots, lettuce, parsley, whatever, I could start at, it says they're gonna germinate at 45. They'll start germinating at 45 degrees, and you can see the progression here, some of the different crops, and I think in your mind, you would probably know this progression, right? If you've got any experience gardening, you would know that, okay, it's gotta be warm, pretty warm if I'm gonna get my watermelon and my cucumbers to germinate and lettuce will germinate pretty easily, right? So if we go, if you look at your chart, you'll see that, yes, I can germinate, or I can get a beet to germinate at 45 degrees, but it's probably gonna take a lot longer than I would like. I mean, I, I don't remember what the value is. I didn't bring the chart with me here. I think it's probably two weeks or something like that for some of the crops, two, three weeks. Some of them were even, you know, 30 days. Yes, they'll germinate at 45 degrees, but it might take 30 days. Um, and that's just off the top of my head, so don't quote me on any of those. But so just because we can plant a seed doesn't mean we should. So keep that in mind. And we've gone over this a little bit fast. So remember the relationship of temperature and time. If you've got an increased time to germination, so if the temperature isn't warm enough and it takes long for the seed to germinate, that seed is gonna be subject to, to an increased risk of loss, either by rot or fungus or some critter digging it out, right? And if you've got cool temperatures once you've germinated the seed, if you can't continue to keep those temperatures warm enough for good growth to occur, you also have a risk of damping off. And you've all seen damping off, right? You have this beautiful little plant comes off and then all of a sudden it just kind of withers at the, withers right at the ground 
and just falls over. Okay, that's damping off. It's a fungal disease. And that will happen if the temperatures are just too cool. So I tried to find the same chart for flowers, and I wasn't able to do it. And so I found this link here, and Terry, you're going to have to come rescue me again because I'm going to call on this link, and then I won't be able to get back out of it. So here's an annual flower seed germination guide. And you'll see as we look down through this, oh, I have to share my screen. Sorry, guys. Um, uh, Terry, you're going to have to come rescue me. Sorry. Uh, that's, uh, I want to I share this one, though, I think. So I stopped that screen. OK, there we go. And then I shared this. I want to share. Ah, I pick. Oh, look at that. I'm learning something. OK. Share screen. Share screen. This one here. Nope. <coughs> Blue. OK. Oh, my goodness. Look at that. Oh, wow. Look at that. Amazing. OK, so you can see here that if you look at all of these flowers on the side over here, just about everything is 70 to 75. There's one that's 65. And unfortunately, pansies wasn't on that list. But I know from our experience in the greenhouse here, as we've been growing flowers, that it takes about 75 degrees to germinate the pansies, even though they survive down to below freezing. So this gives us a little bit of a, you know, a contrast between what we can do with vegetables, beets, lettuce, um, spinach versus what you need to do with flowers. So flowers are going to take a little more intense season extension effort to make them work for you. Okay, so now let me try this completely uncoached. Share. Stop share. Oops, stop share. Share screen. I picked the right one here. Share screen. Oh my goodness, look at that. Okay, there we go. Yay. All right, so there's flowers for you. So, I mean, that would explain why we see a lot of flowers, early season flowers in the garden center, right? Because they're just that much harder to work with. So, let's move to fall real quick. And I think we're pretty good on time here. So, season extension in the fall. So, season extension in the fall is the opposite of spring, right? That makes kind of sense. The soil is already warm. So, we're not trying to warm the soil. We're trying to keep what's already there. But a key difference is that the sunlight is becoming less intense. So, not only are we losing soil warmth, we're losing sunlight. So that has a little bit of control or that has a little bit of an impact on what we can grow and how successful we can grow. We talked about a little bit earlier, um, the lettuce folks in Ord and how their production drops in the winter time. So their greenhouse temperature probably stays close to the same, but without any artificial light, they don't have as much production out of their plants. And you can expect the same thing in your garden, right? You'll be able to grow things. It's just not going to be as intense. It's not going to be as fast. Your production's not going to be as much. So you just need to remember that. Um, we're going to try to protect established plants. And this is probably where most of it has started, right? I've got this beautiful tomato. It's got five or six or seven or eight tomatoes that are almost mature. I don't really like fried green tomatoes, so I'd like them to turn into regular red tomatoes. And so I'm going to protect it. So Somebody says it's going to frost, and so I bring out my sheets, I bring out the quilt to try to get it covered up, to get it through a couple more nights, to get a little more sunshine so that I can have my tomatoes finish off. And then lastly, we'd like to continue to grow cool season crops, and this is where planning comes in, because you want to be able to force, not force, but make sure you're thinking far enough in advance that you can have what you need to keep those crops growing into the fall. So these slides, again, are a little bit out of place, but they came up uh, in the paper that I was kind of using as my framework. So let's walk quickly through some cold tolerance and some plant hardiness that we would see in our garden plants. I don't have any flowers in here. I've only got um, vegetables. So for those of you that prefer flowers, sorry about that. That is not uh, a bias. It's just I didn't get the information in the sources that I was looking at. So tender and very tender plants. And, and there's multiple resources out there where you could get these categories. And you know, you're probably going to get some different terms. I have some temperatures on here in the next couple of slides. And some people may say, I, I disagree. I think it's colder than that. Or no, one time, you know, got to 32 and it was dead. So, but just bear with me. There's some rough categories here. So tender, very tender plants. This is well known to all of us. Tomatoes eggplant, basil, 
some of these very things that you know, peppers, cucumbers, uh, green beans, sweet potatoes especially, you get close to 32, within a whiff of 32, you're gonna turn this, the leaves black, right? So you're gonna, you're gonna get frost damage. So they have to be protected from light frost. And if it gets much below 30, you know, into the 28s, you're gonna lose them. It's, it's that clear, okay? Um, if you've got potatoes that are growing and corn that is growing, you can get a light frost and it might recover because the growing shoot is, you know, is somewhere else, okay, down in the soil. So semi-hardy, something that is likely to survive a light frost. And you can see lettuces, carrots, beets, chard. You know, I, I don't have to read the list for you. You can see some of those. And again, you may say, I disagree, Tim. I don't like that. We'll have to talk about it at a break, okay? Um, hardy. Now, they defined hardy as approximately 10 degrees, all right? So the brassicas, the coal crops, so cabbage, broccoli, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, um, some of these other um, rutabaga, turnips, uh, kale. So you can see kind of a continuum of what you think you can grow or what you want to try to grow. Very hardy, leeks, spinach, I had leeks in my greenhouse over the winter and I took them out two weeks ago and cut them up and put them in supper. So, I mean, they survived, no problem. Now, this is a new category that I would like to introduce called super duper hardy. This was not in any reference that I found, but this is, you see the, the middle there, this is called corn salad. How many of you have heard of corn salad, mache, lamb's lettuce? This is a plant that I uh, came to know when I lived in Switzerland. And it was something that was in the grocery store in big flat baskets. You just go through and pick handfuls of it. Um, you can find it in a couple of catalogs. Um, Johnny's has it. Uh, Territorial Seeds has it. Um, there's a couple others that have it. And you might find it by any of those names. Corn salad, mache, lamb's lettuce. Uh, John Sheeper's catalog has it as well. Um, this survived that entire stretch of January. So this picture was taken the 20th of January. Um, so this was planted last October. So in my greenhouse, so it was, what is it, right around New Year's, it was minus 10, minus 15 at night. So my greenhouse, like I said earlier, is not insulated. So it was minus five inside my greenhouse. And there it is on the 20th of January, after which I picked it, I took it inside and put some olive oil and some balsamic vinegar and some Parmesan flakes and had a very nice salad. So if you're interested in something that will definitely survive uh, through the winter, um, this is a place to start. It has a really great flavor. Um, it doesn't like warm temperatures, so this is definitely a candidate for spring or late summer to get it germinated. If the soil gets too hot, it, it won't germinate. It doesn't, it doesn't like it. And I'm still figuring out where the sweet spot is. Um, so as we close out uh, this first section here, um, let's talk a little bit about planning. So, you know, it's in the spring, it's a little bit easier thinking about it, right? The catalogs are on the table. You know that you have to order seeds because I got to have some to plant in the basement. I have to have some to plant in the garden. The mice got into the other ones, whatever. You know you have to do it. But for the fall, you're not always thinking, oh, man. I wanted to plant that, but I don't have any seeds. So try to think at both ends of the season. I need these in the spring, and I'm thinking I'm going to do it again in the fall, so maybe I should order two packets, okay? Or I want to try this other thing in the fall, so let's flip through the catalog and just order them all at once, okay? And then you've got them. Put them in the refrigerator. They'll be fine, and then you'll have them. The next part, and this is the part where I struggle, is know and prep your garden spot ahead of time. So if I go out to my garden and I look at my garden and I see an empty spot, it's like something has to be planted there. I can't allow that spot to be empty. But if you're going to be a fall gardener, you need to, be, you need to understand either, okay, I'm going to plant this particular crop in this spot because I know I will pull it out in July and I can begin to prep it for the fall. So if you have a bed of broccoli, your broccoli should be finished somewhere in June, somewhere in there. You could prep it out. You could put compost in. You could let it lay fallow for just a little bit. If you're really excited, you could probably put a little bit of a green crop in, get some green manure in there, and then you'd be ready to go for the fall, okay? 
have your supplies ready. If you know you're going to do some kind of season extension, and again, we're gonna to get to those particular tools in a little bit, be ready ahead of, be proactive, not reactive. It's so much easier to have your stuff ready to go, to use the nice long days, and to use the weather that's nice to get your supplies ready. So you know where your plastic is, you know where your tubes are, you know where your sheets are, you know where your row covers are before you get a text on your phone that says winter weather advisory. All right, so start early. And then finally, plan. When do I need to plan what? So it's pretty easy in the spring. Um, soil temperature is about right. Um, I need to get it in the garden. I'm just gonna plant something. In the fall, it's a little bit more regimented, right? Because I can grow stuff longer if I can protect the soil, but I'm running out of light. Um, I may not have as much room. So you need a little bit of planning to understand how long does it take to grow that particular crop. If it takes 48 days to maturity, well then I better back calculate from as late as I think I can go and plant it at the right time. So fall success, we've talked just a little bit about this. Pick the right time for the right crop, so plan it at the right time. Um, we just talked about those, sorry. So then finally, the next, the next piece is the sun is still hot, the soil is still warm. So in the springtime, you know, it's cold, so I don't have to water as much. Um, I want the soil to warm up. I don't use, I'm not driving soil moisture out with a cover because um, the sun's not as intense. But in the fall, you're the opposite, right? And you're probably, fall crops, you're probably planting in August, maybe September, somewhere in there. So the sun can still be intense and it still might be dry. So you need to keep in mind that the fall gardening or the start of the fall gardening looks different than the start of spring gardening. You could even, you might have to consider some light shade and we'll, get, we'll talk just after the break, we'll talk about row covers that can serve as a good shade, a good light shade for your new plants or starting plants. So here's a, an example, two, uh, two planters. Uh, actually, it's two sides of the same planter. And John, where did we get these? Do you remember? From Clyde. From Clyde. Okay, so Clyde. I don't know who Clyde is, but Clyde was very generous. And Clyde gave us these, these uh, planters. So, the, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so Clyde accepted some reimbursement for the use of his planters. Um, so with this particular planter, and there are so many of these, when I was looking for something, um, there's one in one of the catalogs that you see it reproduced in multiple catalogs. It's an application for an iPhone. You see something that works on an iPad. Um, the Farmer's Almanac has something. This one is very simple because you line up this frost, you line up this red line with the frost date. And I've got it lined up here for May 10th here in Lincoln. And you can see the FP is the first planting outside and they're saying you can put onion sets outside. Um, the, at, uh, the last week of March. So in a couple weeks here, you should be able, if Clyde says it, then by golly, you guys better get on it. All right, and then you can see when you can harvest. And if we go to the next slide, you can see what you can do in the fall. So this is the back calculation, right? So here's the last frost date, or, sorry, average first frost date, um, middle of October roughly, and you can back calculate. And you can see the last planting this time. So you can see, and it doesn't really, I uh, think it says, um, oh yeah, the SI here is, is if you're going to do some transplants, you would, it gives you a little bit of an idea for when you would start your transplants to make this last planting date. So, it, I mean, it's, uh, it's something to, for you to kind of work with locally and say, okay, this gives me an idea anyway. I can get in the ballpark um, of what I need to do. So that finishes up for our first hour. So if there's any questions, let me know the questions, and then I'll give you just a little bit of an assignment to do really quick. So I don't, I don't have any questions right now from anybody, Tim. Okay, is that because they're all asleep or I'm actually informing them that well? So you have think, to ask that question. I think you're informing them that well. Oh, okay, all right, Athena. So do you wanna go ahead and give them their assignment? No, no, we've got a couple of questions here in the room. Sorry, Terry, I'll, I'll just, say them out loud. Just remember to repeat them. Yes, I will. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what if you don't have a machine like that? What do you do? 
Okay, so the question was um, in here in Lincoln, uh, the backyard farmers get together on Sat or sorry, the master gardeners get together on Saturdays and do some of the prep work for our demonstration garden here for raising uh, outdoor Nebraska, raising Nebraska outdoors. I don't know which order it goes in um, and preparing those seeds. So this past Saturday, we're doing some cuttings, and in one of the teaching greenhouses here, there was a mist table. And so my answer to that is you got a spray bottle. I have a spray bottle from Earl May, Earl May and you just spray it. And well, I mean, I mean, if, if you're doing cuttings at home, if you go to one of the garden centers, you will find the black flat tray. And then you will also find the high plastic dome that fits over the top. So that gives you the opportunity. It's just a humidity dome and it may even have a lid at the top. So that gives you an option to get that planting media pretty wet. And then, and then you'll keep the humidity in there. And it's like that, you want to make sure that one's not quite, the difference between that greenhouse and at home is that that greenhouse, when the sun comes out, it gets hot in there. And so that's why that constant automatic misting is on there. At home, you'd have the opportunity to mist it, kind of move it out of the window to let those plants get a chance to get started. And then as soon as they get some roots, then they'd have an opportunity to be able to take up a little bit more moisture and they could stand that more direct sunlight. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. And then there was another question back here. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I think if you're going to do it, oh, sorry, the question was, is there a specific time of day or a certain time of day you need to take your soil temperature? So I think if you're going to do it, just be consistent with the time so that you're taking the same data point each day. So for me, it's when I come home from work, I go out to the garden and I check and I see, and I can see that, oh, it was warm today, the soil was hot, or the sun was hot, the soil is dry, give it a drink, I can see that the temperature went up. It's just like if you're on a diet, you would weigh yourself at the same time every day, so you have a trend line that means something to you. If you're all over the place in times of day of measuring, you don't really know what's going on, but you can at least see the trend if you're measuring the same time every day. So Tim, we have a question um, now in the chat box. Okay. We're asking which um, structures withstand the wind the best? Well, that is a good question. And can I, can I hold that question till we get to the next piece, till the next hour? Yep. Okay, so we'll come to the, the next hour is entirely on structures and how to. So we'll get to that piece, okay? Any more questions? No, One more. Okay. So the question was, when you're starting your seedlings indoors and you're using um, grow lights, do you use grow mats? And so I believe the standard practice is, and it's my experience as well, is you use the heat mats to get things germinated. So you would use the heat mats and probably a dome on your seedling mix to get your seeds germinated and up out of the ground. As soon as they're up out of the ground, turn off the heat mat or reduce the heat because they're going to grow really fast and it's going to dry out the mixture and then take off the lid. So does that make sense? Okay. All right. Okay. If you leave that heat on, they're going to get really long and stretchy. So go ahead and take it off. All right. Well, we're All right. at 730 right now. So we will um, take a 15 minute break and we'll all come back at 715 or 745. Okay. And then if you guys have any more questions, just type them in the box and we'll answer those right when we come back. Okay, so we'll get started again. Um, Tim, I've got a couple more questions in the chat box for you. Okay, hopefully I have some answers. Um, when do you plant spring garlic and when is it ready to harvest? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the specifics of garlic per se, but I do know alliums or onions. And, you know, I would say here pretty soon, let's look at our chart. Uh, have you got me turned on here so I can scroll back? Yep. Yeah, let's see if what Clyde says. Clyde says... Um, if you look there at the end of March, so garlic is in the same family as 
onions, an allium, and an onion set is a small onion bulb and you're gonna be planting small cloves of spring garlic. So I would assume roughly that in this neighborhood, as soon as we start to get over the hump in terms of hard, nasty frosts and consistent cold temperatures at night where we're below freezing all the time, I would say in this neighborhood, the end of March, beginning of April, you should be able to start putting in um, garlic. And you know, the way I do it is I buy two. You know, I buy two on impulse. I go out and I put one in right now, it doesn't come up and a couple of weeks later I put in another one. So, I mean, if you wanna use that approach, trial and error, I mean, I'm a scientist and so trial and error is a big part of my life. So that, that, that's how I had answered that question. All right, that was the last question. Okay, all right, so we didn't get a chance to uh, do our assignment, so now we're gonna do our assignment. So I'm gonna go backwards a little bit to my um, soil profile here. All right, so this is soil profile. I was talking to uh, a friend here in class about this particular profile at the break, and another reason that we look at four uh, four inches below the surface is also not only to take to be able to see the trend better, but it also takes out some of the daily variation. So if I had this at two inches, where we might plant green bean seeds, or if I planted it, it planted it, you know, a half inch or a quarter inch, where we plant some spring crops, you would see these lines go all the way up here. You know, as soon as we got a sunny day. We'd be up here in the 60s and the 70s. And then at night, it would drop way back down. So it'd almost be impossible to see any kind of reasonable trend about what the real temperature is. So at four inches, yes, we have some variation here. But you can at least see that over time, we're going up. And you can see that, OK, at this period right here, starting at the end of February, my soil was consistently above 35 degrees. And so you can see that kind of trend when we're a little bit deeper. Okay, so for your assignment, we're gonna do this real quick. I want you to look at this handout that you've got there, and then I want you to pick from the other chart, um, the, uh, one of the other two charts that he gave you, the one that shows germination temperature. I just want you to pick five vegetables, five crops from that chart, okay? So then what I want you to do is take the what I, how is it labeled? Is it labeled optimal germination temperature on there? Yeah. So I want you to pick the optimal germination temperature for that particular crop. And I want you to write on your soil profile, on this chart here, I want you to write when you would plant that vegetable in the hopes that it would germinate within about seven days. Okay, does that make sense? So. For instance, let's look at this. So if I took this point right here, it says the total temperature is about 53. That doesn't mean I can plant everything that germinates at 53 because it goes way down here and it stays down here for a while, right? What I'm looking for is the temperature at which I could reasonably expect my crop to germinate in about seven days. So when is the temperature going to be in the right range for the amount of time it takes to germinate? I need some head nods to know that this makes sense. Okay, it makes sense. All right, so let's take a couple of minutes and then we'll just pick a couple and we'll walk through it, okay? This is where an average would have been a little bit better for you, so you'll have to be creative. It might be a way to kind of um, maybe draw some, some subdivisions on your chart here. So you might be able to draw a subdivision here. Oh, I guess it's in five degrees already, so that's probably close enough um, for subdivisions.
Okay, give it 30 more seconds, and then we'll look at a couple real quick. Tim, do you want them to enter a couple into the chat box? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. So if some, of, some counties, if you want to go ahead and enter a couple of your results, I can read them off for him. And I don't have my chart in front of me. I'm going to steal this chart right here. Okay, Terry, what do we got? Um, I have beans, May 28th. Okay, so beans on our chart here, it says anywhere between 60 and 80. The optimal temperature is about 80. And what did you say, May 28th? Yep. So yeah, if we come up here, we can see that somewhere right in here is probably gonna be pretty good for beans. Now remember, this is at four inches deep. So if we had any kind of sunshine during that time, the two inches deep or the depth of your finger, however you plant your beans, that's probably going to be a pretty good place. Okay, have you got a cool season example there, Terry? I have corn at April 30th. Okay, April 30th. So corn we've got off this particular chart, we've got uh, 60 to 95, optimum is 95. So, I mean, I would, I mean, based on this, it's probably a little bit early for corn, but, um, you know, I would probably go a little bit later, but, you know, it's your experience, right? So what, you know, where are you located is part of it as well. They're in Scott's Bluff. Okay. So that probably makes a good enough difference for us. Um, uh, John, what's that watermelon that we've had for in forever trouble with? Planets and stars or whatever? Or Moon and stars. Moon and stars. Okay. Moon and stars takes like 100 degrees <laughs> to germinate. I mean, it never, if it's not on the heat mats for a long, long time, it seems like it never germinates. Yeah. So it's got to, you know, it depends on the heat. Okay. Let's try one more cold, cold example, cool season example. Anybody here? Athena, did you have an example? Not to put you on the spot. I just know your name. Okay. Don't, don't forget you have to repeat what she says. Okay, right. So she, uh, Athena took it a little bit different. She picked, she went to the optimum temperature on her chart and then found that, that optimum temperature on her, on this profile chart and then picked which plants would germinate in that particular time. Is that in, in seven days? So she said cabbage, um, optimum temperature, I find that hard to believe that the optimum temperature for cabbage is 85. Um, but nevertheless, um, let's go with the let's go with the lower range. Let's go with 50 degrees for cabbage or even 60 degrees. If we were to do that, optimum range is somewhere in here. You know, you could probably go starting right here, you know, the first part of first part of May. That would be for seeds for cabbage, but a lot of times we plant cabbage is transplants, right? And so you would probably use maybe even a heat mat or not a heat mat, but you'd be inside. So your ambient temperature inside would be probably 60 or 70. And your plants would, you could start them way back in here inside and then begin to transplant outside. So not the most, perhaps the exercise isn't the clearest. I think I'll work a little bit on how to do it. I might put some blocks on the chart or something, but you be, can begin to see the connection between soil temperature and germination. There is, there is a requirement there. And so if you've got the, right, the wrong seeds at the wrong temperature, nothing's gonna happen. If you've got lettuce seeds and the soil's 45 degrees, and pretty soon you're gonna see lettuce, all right? You've gotta protect it. So, I mean, it, it, it works, all right? So let's move on here. Um, let's go to, uh, let me go back to the beginning. Sorry, we'll go through these really quick. So questions? All right, we did the assignment. So let's um, recap where we've been. 
this is where we start and let's uh, get going again here. So what have we learned so far? As gardeners in Nebraska, we are not at all happy that we have to wait until the middle of May to start gardening, nor are we happy that we have to stop in the middle of October, right? So to do that, to change that, we're gonna modify our local frost date, right? How are we gonna modify the frost date? Hands in Lincoln, anybody? John. Right, but what do we call it before? We just we're going to control the flow of heat, right? We're going to control the flow of heat. How are we going to control the flow of heat? We're going to make a microclimate. All right. So we're going to control what we've got. We're going to try to capture what we have in a structure that modifies the soil temperature that gives us a different climate for those particular plants. Okay. We're going to pick plants and transplants that match the plan we want to execute. Do I want to grow something that's done before it gets too hot? Do I want to get an early start? Do I want to win the first tomato contest? So we look through our seed catalogs, we grow transplants that are going to help us reach our desired goals. Um, we pick the crops that we want to plant, I guess I just said that, and then we plan. So in the springtime it's a little bit different because we're waiting for the soil temperature to get to the right place or we have to protect some of those early season transplants. In the fall, we want to make sure we have a much, enough maturity time left and we want to be prepared when it begins to get cold so that we can cover things up and keep as much soil, uh, soil temperature as possible. All right, so let's talk about tools and techniques. How are we going to do this? What are we going to do to make these structures? What are we going to do to modify or make our microclimate? So as you can imagine, and as you've probably seen either on the internet, on Pinterest, in garden catalogs, in the backyard farmer garden, anywhere. You know, it's simple, complex, everything in between, all right? So there is no one particular way. And if there's one thing that I want you to take away from tonight is that this is not the way to do season extension. This is a way to do season extension. In this piece in particular, I'm going to bring a lot of my own experience because I've tried quite a few different things, all right? So it's not because it's the best, it's just what I have experience with and it's easier for me to talk to, okay? So it can be expensive, they can be homemade, in, sorry, inexpensive, homemade, recycled. If you have, um, I know in Omaha and Lincoln they have uh, what's called the Restore from Habitat for Humanity, so there's all kinds of recycled building materials. They used to have in Lincoln called the Eco Store, which was even a, another type of, same type of store, recycled building materials, which I think is closed now, or did they reopen? I, I don't remember, but old storm windows, old doors, uh, wood, anything that you can think of. I mean, let your, let your imagination run wild and, and have some fun with this. Get some ideas and just see what you can make happen, all right? You can also buy the more expensive purchase design solutions and the garden catalogs will gladly help you out with that. Um, I'm thinking of one in particular who the guilty shall go unnamed. That's just, are you serious? That is just ridiculous for that. But anyway, you can buy them and they come in a box. UPS delivers them to your door, you put them together, you dump some soil in and you're off to the races, okay? So it can be done that way. Again, the choice is up to you. So I wanna talk about two things real quick that you would see on a commercial scale, right? Because it's kind of hard to cover that entire field with a structure of some kind. So commercial approaches are often a localized season extension if you want to, okay? So this is a field of butternut squash, and you can see that they have covered each row with a plastic mulch, and you can see that you can kind of see the profile there, you can see the profile there. They're using a raised bed. So we have a raised bed, we have plastic mulch, there's probably a drip irrigation under here somewhere. And this particular mulch happens to be black, could be clear, could be red. Um, all of those approaches give you some season extension by warming the soil temperature locally. And I need to cheat and see what my next slide is. Okay, we'll go back. All right, so black mulch works. Black mulch works on conduction, right? So that black mulch has to be laying right on the soil. And if that black mulch is laying on the soil, he can probably get two to four degrees, maybe a little bit more of soil warming right around those plants. So for a crop like 
butternut squash, that's important. It requires a higher temperature to get germinated. It likes it warmer. Probably get a little bit of radiation off of that black plastic. Um, so it's going to make happy butternut squash. You could go with clear plastic, which will also warm up the temperature, right? The sunlight goes through the plastic directly into the soil, warms it up. But the problem with clear plastic is you have weeds underneath, right? So the weeds are still growing. Under black, you're fine. Under clear plastic, there's going to be a whole bunch of weeds. Um, red plastics and some of the other plastics are considered to be reflective. You take some of the wavelengths of light that the plants use and reflect it back up towards the plants and so they can use it. So this is very typical for a large scale commercial production. Um, you can try to do it at home. You can buy the plastics. You can buy the landscape clips. I mean, it, it can be done at home. It's just, this is an automated process. There's a tractor with a roll. The guy drives down the field. It makes the bed. It lays the plastic. It puts the dirt on the side. It lays the irrigation hose underneath. And they can just do that all day long, as you can see they have. And you can see that he has, he's got one age of crop over here. He's got this age of crop right here. Looks like he's got a row cover of some kind over here. So there's a, you know, this is intense commercial agriculture, but it's season extension. Okay, so another one is biodegradable mulches. Okay, so the ones that we saw just a couple minutes ago, or just a slide ago, were plastic. So at the end of the season, you've got a big pile of plastic you got to get rid of, right? Some of it's probably degraded because of the UV light, but still, you've got plastic that you got to get rid of. There's a disposable, there's a disposal issue there. Something that's being studied now and something that's being studied right here in one of the horticulture research group here at UNL with Dr. Sam Wortman is biodegradable mulches. So same concept, right? I've got a mulch, I lay it down, I'm trying to get soil temperature raised, keep weeds suppressed, keep moisture in the soil. Um, same type of thing, black mulch. And I'm not sure of the colors on some of these mulches, but the, you know, the impact would be the same. Black mulch is going to raise the soil temperature a little bit. Clear mulch is going to raise it a little bit more. Clear plastic is going to raise it just a little bit more. Um, but these can be composted right into the field. They're starches, of pl they're plant starches. And so you pull your plants and just disc them right into the plant. The one video I saw was a, um, a big pull behind rototiller. So once the plants were removed, the guy just drove his rototiller right down the raised bed and composted and tilled that mulch into the soil. All right. So again, these particular the biodegradable mulches are not, you know, they're mulch. Uh, sorry, they're still in research phase, so you can find them, but not as much uh, commercially available as some of the plastic mulches. And um, yeah, so that's good. So row covers. So this is probably the most simplest option. So you may have seen these, and I think my picture is a little two back. So this is a row cover right here. Um, we'll come back to that. So this is a polyester fabric. It's a polypropylene fabric. They come in multiple weights. You can buy them at garden centers. You can buy them probably at home improvement centers. You can certainly buy them online. And if you buy them in uh, more of a supply catalog as opposed to a retail catalog. So if you're looking at something like a farm tech catalog or an AM Leonard catalog or something like that, you will find multiple weights, multiple widths, um, and multiple lengths. I mean, you, they'll probably drop a huge roll on your front porch if you want one. Or you can buy you know, multiple folded sheets in a nice little bag at retail that would fit over your, your beds. Okay, So multiple thicknesses, weights, widths, and lengths. Um, the data that I saw, or the information I saw, was 0.3 ounces to 2.5 ounces per square yard. So you can imagine that's a pretty light, feathery, fluffy material. Fluffy is not the best word, but lightweight material. Um, and this particular one right here is one of the lightest weights. I don't remember um, what weight that is. Uh, I bought that on an online catalog. You know, I bought it with my seed order one year. So the lightest weights, um, if you think about a half ounce per square yard, you can see your hand through it. I mean, there's not a whole lot going on there, right? You can pour water, water will go through it, sunlight will go through it, primarily used for insect exclusion. So if you've got a horrible problem with squash bugs in your garden, you can use some of this lightweight fabric up until it's time for pollination to try to keep the squash bugs and cucumber beetles 
out of your out of your cucumbers and out of your your butternut squash. When you need to get pollination, you obviously have to take them off. Okay, minimal heat retention. I mean, you can imagine that if you were trying to sleep on your bed and you had a blanket of that thickness, you're going to get cold. So there's not a whole lot of protection that goes on with something of that lightweight. Medium weights, the data I saw said two to four degrees. I mean, I don't have a picture of that. I don't, I, it would have been good to see a picture where you could see a hand between various weights to understand the, the visual look, but I didn't, I didn't have that. So this is something you'd probably use in the fall. The weatherman says frost is coming. Um, go out and wrap up your tomatoes, especially if it's just gonna be a light frost or we're gonna get close to 32. This is something that you would use for that light protection. And the heaviest weights, you know, two and a half ounces or an ounce and 25, I can't remember what I said, two and a half ounces. Um, definitely good frost protection, probably several more degrees than two to four degrees of protection, but you'd have to take it off in the day because it's thick enough that no light comes through. If things are still growing, now you're throwing shade on your stuff. So this is gonna be a little bit higher maintenance. It'll keep it, it'll keep it warm at night, keep it protected at night but you're gonna to have to go out in the morning and take it off, okay? It's not a day long cover or 24 seven cover, okay? So there again is a picture of the row cover. That's my hand behind that light cover. So a couple different applications. You have what's called a floating row cover and the lightweight crop of lettuce. Um, you just lay it on top of your lettuce, lay it on top of your spinach kind of knock down the corners, you're just trying to keep the heat in. You're blanketing your crop essentially, and you're trying to keep the heat in the ground around your crop. So you're just floating it over the top. Um, pretty simple approach actually. So the next approach would be the supported row cover. And so this probably gives you a little bit more day-to-day um, -day, um, ease of use, right? So I've got these hoops in my garden or some kind of structure in my garden if it's way too hot, there's no chance of frost, I can probably take the hoops all the way off, or sorry, the cloth all the way off, or roll it off to the side and kind of secure it down. When I know it's gonna be cold for a couple days, I could put it back on there and, and keep it covered up. So pretty simple, you can see some different clips there. And this looks like some kind of a netting material. It's not really a, 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 a row cover like we've been talking about, but the, the concept is exactly the same. We've got some hoop structures and a way to hold it on. So a couple of things to remember then about row covers is you can use them for insect exclusion, but when it's time to pollinate, you're gonna have to take them off or you're not gonna get any pollination. So if your beans are blooming, you're trying to keep the bean beetles off. If you've got your beans next to your potatoes and uh, you've got some friends going back and forth, you know, you're gonna have to, to get your can of diesel fuel out and start picking them off and burning them yourself because you won't be able to keep your row covers on, right? The other thing to remember is they are lightweight and they will fly away, okay? So we had a question about what stands up to wind. Uh, this is one that does not stand up to wind if it's not secured. So you see you've got bricks here. I've used landscape pins, uh, old four, you know, old four, four by fours, pieces of wood, whatever it takes to hold them down for the evening, all right? So that's, that's row covers. Um, Pretty simple concept, you know, this is entry level season extension here, okay? I'm just trying to protect just a little bit longer um, to get us, you know, maybe a couple extra weeks on an occasional night where it's going down below freezing. So the next piece, and I don't have them in order from simple to complex, but that's okay. Your minds are very supple and you'll be able to run with me. So hoop houses are high tunnels. So this again is more of a commercial application. So this is what you would see. This is what you see when you see a panned shot of the backyard farmer garden. During the backyard farmer starting in April, you will see two hoop houses in the background, right? If you go to Walmart or Orchelin or TSC or Shopco in the springtime, you will see hoop houses. Um, a lot of nurseries will use hoop houses instead of a, or in connection with, or in combination with a regular heated greenhouse. But a hoop house is exactly what it says it is. It's a row of hoops, semicircular metal posts, usually galvanized metal of some kind of a certain diameter, depending on the width that you're trying to span. Um, the width and the height vary greatly, depending on the application, depending on the manufacturer, 
depending on if you want to drive your tractor through it or not. Um, great variety, okay? Covered with polyethylene plastic, usually some kind of uh, UV inhibited plastic, you know, depending on the weight. Um, often two layers, so you'll have one layer right on the hoops, then you'll have another layer and there'll be a fan that blows air in between those layers to give a little bit of insulation. And these can be simple or complex. Like I said, they could be hoops with plastic and doors, or they could be heated with thermostats. They could be with ventilation. They could have some artificial lights. So, you know, in many cases, these are greenhouses. They're much cheaper than a glass or a polycarbonate greenhouse that um, has a, you know, a concrete base or a heating system. These are a much simpler approach to a commercial type application of season extension. So I've got just a couple examples here. So here is a hoop house with roll up sides. So you see this guy's got, he's got a vent. Sorry, I can't touch, I'm supposed to show it on the screen. So you've got um, a vent here, right? So all the heat is coming up to the top. He's got a vent here. My guess is down here, he's got a fan that's pulling air through would be my guess. He's got a solar panel right here, it looks like. So. He's probably got some electricity going on here. Um, you've got sliding doors. He's got roll-up sides. So when it starts to get hot, he's rolling it up, trying to get air through there because it'll get warm in there. It's very warm, very fast. For those of us that were in the greenhouse here on campus on Saturday morning, as soon as the sun came out, it was warm, right? And then you hear the fan kick on, you try to cool it off. So in our greenhouse here on campus, you know, they've got it probably set for 75 degrees, it'd be my guess. And as soon as the sun comes out, it's 80, 85, 90, and then the fan comes on and cools it off. So this is, it looks like it's a grow in the ground application. And our next picture is also grow in the ground application. So here's a guy that's really working the commercial aspects of it. You see he's got, um, looks like he's got maybe an open field over there. Maybe on both sides, it's hard to tell, but he's got roll-up sides. Um, he's using raised beds, using irrigation, growing lettuce. And, and this is a serious lettuce manufacturer right here. And you can see the rows and rows of lettuce. He's, he's got a crop that's ready, a crop that's ready. It looks like a crop that's just planted. So this guy's got the planting figured out. And you can see how long that is. My guess is that's 200 feet, probably from here to the end. So that, that's a long hoop house, right? So this is commercial. If you got room, in your backyard, I say go for it because you could do a lot. That'd be a lot of fun. But you know, most of the time that's not gonna work for us in urban settings. You can't eat that much less either. And you know, these are, you know, like I said, these are the entry level approaches, right? So I mean, if you're a commercial farmer and you're really wanting to get into market gardening, you would probably start with some kind of structure, either like this one or this one, not this long, of course, but to, to give you a little bit to begin the season with and to, to extend the season. So now let's get into the most practical or what I think is the most practical application or practical approach to season extension in, the, in your backyard and that is the raised bed in conjunction, excuse me, conjunction with some other techniques. So what is a raised bed? Um, exactly what it says. I have a mound, a bed of soil that is raised probably, I don't know, depending on the structure, a couple inches off the ground, and it provides you several things. That soil is up in the air, warms up a little bit faster, stays warm a little bit longer. Um, if you talk about our discussion about microclimate a little bit earlier, remember we said cold air is gonna run off, right? Cold air is gonna flow down into the valley. So if I have a series of raised beds in my garden, I can expect that the top of that raised bed where the seeds are germinating, is going to be a little bit warmer than what's down in the valley. Okay, pretty simple approach. Approved drainage, so water is going to run through that soil profile a little bit better because it's been mounded up, it's kind of been aerated, it's nice there for it to drain, and you avoid planting bed compaction. So a little bit of raised bed theory for you here. So I like this picture right here. This was from a group in Australia that were studying raised beds in a really a really wet condition or a, a, a marginal area, I guess. And you can see exactly what, you know, the picture describes what I just said. So we have soil that's up, water drains out or through the profile into the, into the gullies. People are walking, you know, here or here. And they even had, I guess they had corn here. I didn't look at the side. I just liked the picture a lot. So you can see the, the you know, the simple concept behind the raised bed. 
So, you know, it's one thing to make a raised bed just by itself. So we saw in that very first picture with the plastic, some guy came through with the tractor and his tractor probably tilled the soil and it had a little attachment on the back that made that raised bed and then behind that was the thing that laid the plastic right on top of it. So all of that automation works very well. But if you just try to use a raised bed in your backyard, it can be a little bit hard to control, right? Because you end up walking on the edges maybe and the edges kind of get a little roded off, it gets dry. So what started off as a beautiful rectangular symmetrical raised bed turns into some kind of a pile that has maybe three or four things able to grow on top because everything else is on the edge and keeps falling off. So a typical approach is to build a raised bed, right? So we're going to build it out of something. Um, and we'll see a couple of examples here. But again, this is go if, you know, if you want to find something creative, if you want to just get your own ideas, you know, the internet is your friend. So go to Pinterest, just type in raised bed, and you'll see the number of things came up. And I, I did one page of images. So I just typed in raised bed, clicked on images at the top of the Google search bar, and all of these things were in those, you know, the first pages. So dimensional lumber, go to Menards, go to wherever, buy the lumber to build it. You know, buy the cinder blocks to build it. So you can make the frame and then you can even fill up the holes of the cinder blocks and put things in the holes. Um, recycled plastic decking. So then the Trex decking that lasts a little bit longer. Um, you can purchase a raised bed. Just like we said earlier, you can purchase some of the, the extension techniques. You can purchase a raised bed. Um, and I even saw recycled things. There was a guy that had three or four bathtubs lined up. I don't know where he got them, but he had bathtubs lined up. There was, there was raised beds. If you think about it, black on the outside, absorb a lot of solar radiation, drain hole. I mean, it seems like a pretty good idea. You could probably grow potatoes in your recycled bathtub. An old bed frame. So someone had an old bed frame in their yard and had put some of the dimensional lumber or something underneath and things were coming up out of the bed frame. Uh, tires, there was a, how many of you have been here in Lincoln to the Martin's Orchard up by, uh, up by uh, Ceresco? Nobody's been to Martin's Orchard by Ceresco one hand. Really? Oh my goodness, you guys. You got to get out of you got to get out of the house. So, Martin's Orchard has a playground for kids and they've built this huge pyramid of tires. So, it's a sandbox for the kids, but you can imagine just a couple overlapping tires filled with soil and I have a garden pyramid that I could very easily call a raised bed with black tires that soil is warm enough fast. Throw a blanket over the top of it, you have a season extension pyramid, which I didn't even talk about in my slides here. Or whatever, I mean, yeah, I can't even emphasize enough, just go find something to build a raised bed with. So a raised bed in the backyard, John Porter probably talked about this a couple weeks ago. Um, a little bit ergonomic, you don't have to reach down as far, you don't have to reach as far as cross. You do have to fill it with de decent soil, right? So you've got, now you have a, a bucket to fill. You know, you've built something that has a hole in it, you've got to fill it up. So some clay, good clay soil from Lincoln, Nebraska is not going to work. You're going to have to find some topsoil, you're going to have to find some compost to fill up that box. Keep in mind it's going to dry out faster, but the soil will warm up sooner um, and it'll be ready to work and plant faster. So let's, let's look at how we can combine it with a, some season extension. So this is my setup in my backyard. So this is just two by six lumber. I'm screwed at the edges, um, filled with compost and some topsoil from the uh, Lincoln City Transfer Station. So the hoops are half inch PVC pipe, thin wall half inch PVC pipe comes in 10 foot sections at the home improvement store, probably $4 maybe. I didn't have had these for a long time. I haven't looked recently, but probably $4. Um, and you have another one across the top here. And then at each, this, is, this top piece here is called a purlin, P-U-R-L-I-N. Um, and it's you know basically a support structure, keeping things from going back and forth sideways and keeping the bows, you know, keeping from the plastic from bending down into the middle. Um, so right here, I've just got some long bolts and nuts. You could use baling wire. Um, you do need to secure them together. Otherwise, these bows will just slide 
right along there. So they do need to be secured together. So that, I mean, this is entry level raised bed gardening with low tunnel right here. And this raised bed could be, this is mine, but there are so many examples. We'll see another example here in just a minute. Let's see what my next picture is. So this is the raised bed covered up. And this picture was taken on 24th of January. So this is hardware store drop cloth plastic. Probably not the best approach, but I helped at Spring Affair one year and they were throwing away all the plastic on the tables. So I took a whole bunch home and turned it into a raised bed, right? So this is probably, I'm gonna say six mil plastic. You can buy all kinds of thicknesses, all kinds of widths just at the hardware store. Um, it usually comes in a big bulk roll. Ask the guy to cut it off at a certain length for you, okay? Um, I would use the six mil stuff. I would get the heavy stuff because the lights, I mean, it takes a beating. You've got sun beating down on it. You've got wind beating on it. You're trying to clip it. So get the heavy stuff. So go ahead and go with the six mil. The light penetration is not going to be that big a deal for when we're getting started, right? Um, the thing about hardware plastic is that it's not, typically it's not UV inhibited. So it doesn't have any UV protection in it. So after two years, two seasons, this will be shredded and I will have to throw it away and start over. So the sunlight beating down early spring, late season will shred it. And if you leave it up all winter, um, it'll get brittle, it'll crack. And mine is already starting to crack right here. So this will be its last hurrah this year. When I take it off, it'll be done and I'll have to find some new stuff. Um, for the ends, so you can see what I did here. I had, this is an experiment. I had some plywood laid around. I thought, oh, I'll just make some permanent ends. I had some bungee cords that went from here to here so I could keep it nice and sealed up and they came off really nice. The bungee cords were destroyed by the sun and the, the wood blocks the sun. So, okay, the idea didn't work, but you know, it keeps the hot air in and it was, gave me something to do on a warm fall afternoon. So I, the ends are a little bit of a challenge, I will admit. The ends are a little bit of a challenge because by the time you get to the end here, I have to have a piece of plastic that comes way out here so that when I bend it down, it comes all the way down here. All right? I gotta be able to cover up that end. So I've got a big wad of plastic here at the end when I'm done. And so that can be a little bit cumbersome. So you can try to fold it like a Christmas present as best as possible, maybe some clothes pins maybe some binder clips, um, but then you'll get water in there and then the mosquitoes will get in there. So, I mean, it can be a little bit of a mess. It gets, you know, stuff down in there, but that's just the cost of doing business, right? So you just have to kind of deal with that. So does this look simple enough? I mean, this is, this is easy stuff here, guys. So you can do this in a weekend. You know, you can put a raised bed together and, and you're ready to go. All right, so this is how, a little more detail, this is how I put it together first. So this was the inside of the two by four, and that's just a conduit strap. You know, galvanized conduit strap just down the aisle from the PVC pipe at the home improvement store. And those are galvanized nails. So, you know, I nailed it in and it just slides right down in there. I will say that if you hit that with your mantis tiller, that's a mess. You will either bounce your mantis tiller into next week or you will bury that pin somewhere in your raised bed and you will find it later in the season. So this idea works, but you know, it comes with some caveats. And here's a little bit of detail on, these are just one inch binder clips, no big notebook binder clips from Office Depot that are clipped onto that one inch PVC pipe. And make sure you give yourself a little bit of slack. You can see how I've wrapped that plastic around the pipe a little bit. If you pull your plastic taut, all the way tight, and then try to put that binder clip on there, you're gonna tear your plastic and it won't hold. So what you need to do is start at one end, give yourself enough slack to be able to cover the end, and then start on this row, and then connect this row all the way down, okay? So then you have to make sure you give yourself enough slack for both ends, plus the slack you're gonna have when you wrap it around the posts, okay, or when you clip it to the posts. And then you'll need to come up with some kind of solution for down here. I don't have a solution on this side because this is the side I get in and out of. On the other side, I've got some, uh, some logs or some lumber holding the plastic down because if the cat gets in there, that's not a raised bed anymore, that's a litter box. So keep that in mind that wherever you're not getting in and out, um, make sure you got it sealed down. 
Okay, so here's the one we have at the backyard farmer garden. And I realized as I was putting my presentation together that this is not the one I wanted the picture of, but that's okay. So you can see this one here has got two sets of uh, lumber there. Those are two by tens, so that's about 18 inches tall. Um, this is a treated four by four post. And these, these boards have been treated with uh, a weather sealant like uh, Thompson's water seal, an equivalent, just to, but it's not treated lumber. It's, it's regular dimensional lumber. And then this is city one-to-one -one compost and topsoil. And you can see that there's 1.8 yards of soil in there. So you do the math. If you figure out how big your um, wheelbarrow is hey. and how much it costs hey. to drop that much soil in your driveway and how many trips you'll have to take to get hey, it Tim. all the way back to your backyard. Yes. It's 60-40 compost. 60-40. Okay. So 60-40 compost topsoil. And John, when you say that we found that even to be a little bit clay, probably a little bit more clay than we'd like, it's 60-40. Yeah. So, I mean, be careful with that. Um, you know, find, you know, when you're filling it, do the best you can. And if, I mean, if you try to fill this with, you know, the bags of potting soil, you're going to go broke. So you, you almost got to go with a bulk purchase that much anyway, a yard, and almost two yards. Okay, so here's another approach to um, putting the, the ends of the bows. So these are on the raised bed that's immediately to the east of the one I just showed you. So this is a bigger piece of PVC. I believe this is probably an, uh, an inch and a half. Um, no, sorry, an inch, an inch. So that PVC bow, this bow right here, slides right into here, okay? So these are just small pieces cut and the holes are be able to screw into the side of the rails and then that bow just slips right in there. And there's enough tension and enough spring on those bows that they stay in place. You don't need to hold them with anything else. You don't have to screw into them once they're in these cups or once they're in these sockets, they will stay in that socket. And this is from the end. So this is the last bow and this socket is for the end piece, okay? So here's a couple other ideas for holding the plastic onto the bows. So here's a piece of the same diameter PVC pipe. So when you cut this piece right here, you're gonna have a little bit left over. And so then you proceed to cut a whole bunch of these. And these are probably an inch and a half long maybe. Um, and about a third of the clip, maybe a little bit more than that has been cut out. Probably with a band saw just to cut it out straight. Make sure you sand, kind of sand these edges a little bit and it should just fit right on there and, and hold it in place. And don't, don't be shy using them because uh, you'll want th that plastic held on there well. Here's an old garden hose, same concept, three quarter inch garden hose. I cut it with a piece of tin snips and it slips on there. I would say this is probably a little bit more secure than the garden hose, but the garden hose does work. So here's another approach. So you don't want to nail something. Those other pieces were nailed right here. What if you don't want to hit it with your mantis tiller, which I'm getting tired of hitting it with my mantis tiller, so I may go to this approach. This is a rebar pin, two, 24 inch, three, three, sorry, 24 inches long, three eight inches diameter rebar pin. You can buy them at the home improvement store, um, probably $2, I suppose, something in there. Um, I just pounded it in uh, with a hammer, and you'll see that the top of the tube fits right over the rebar pin and then you cut to length and then you just bend it into your raised bed just like that. Now you wouldn't have to have a raised bed. You could do it on the ground. You have your, your soil, your mound of soil. You say, you're not, I'm not ready to spend the money on lumber. I wanna try it first. This is a perfect way to try it. Those rebar pins and the, po and the PVC tubing, you, know, you don't have to be in a raised bed. It'll work just like this, okay? All right, so this is a temperature profile from my setup right here. Sorry for the, so from this setup right here, I put a compost thermometer in here at four inches deep, and then I use data from the crop watch to produce this graph. And it's a little bit misleading because the Walton data was 
this is the rolling average. So you can see from the beginning of January, the middle of January, all to uh, the middle of last week, the soil was frozen at four inches down. And in my raised bed, it's a little bit warmer. And it's a little bit misleading because I picked the wrong data off of the Walton chart. I should have picked the daily numbers, but I was for I just wasn't paying attention. I think I was the the heading had scrolled out of this pink the the page and I was picking the wrong number. So you're not seeing the variation, you're not seeing the steady value that you would normally see in mine. Um, you would probably see something like that if I were to average it. But what I want to get at is the trend. You you can clearly see that the soil is warmer in the raised bed under the low tunnel than it is in the bare soil. This is a bare soil value, so there's a thermometer, a temperature probe stuck out in the ground at Walton or at Havelock. You can see the little cage right across the street from the Lancaster Event Center where they're taking this data from. And the ground is frozen. And we saw earlier tonight it's 34 now. Um, today it was the average, the rolling average is 34. So it's go beginning to go up, but inside my raised bed, it's already warm. And I already planted some stuff in there just to see what would come up. And it hasn't come up yet, but we'll see. So raised bed with low tunnel. So we saw a lot of different pictures, talked a lot, at least I've talked a lot. Um, things to be aware of. The temperature is gonna rise fast. As soon as the sun comes out, it's gonna get hot in there, all right? So if you've planted anything in there, it's, make sure you keep an eye on the water, okay? Because if something comes up and it doesn't have much roots and you get a sunny day like Saturday, you're gonna wilt it all. So make sure you keep an eye on the temperature, make sure you keep an eye on the water. And if you need to roll up sides, you need to roll up the ends, you know, do that for a little bit to drive the temperature down just you know, for the benefit of your plants. Um, the soil is gonna dry out fast. So, and if you're trying to put new transplants in there, pretty soon I'm gonna be putting my broccoli plants in there. And new transplants are the same. They have a tiny little root ball, so until they get established and get those roots spread out into the rest of the soil, you need to make sure they're watered. On the back end, you're getting ready to take the cover off of your low tunnel. Remember that it's been inside this nice, warm microclimate. Now you're about to expose it to the cruel, harsh world, right? So you have a plant that hasn't been exposed to the wind. It's been in a nice, warm, humid environment. It's been, yes, there's been variation in the temperature, but it hasn't been as much as outside. And so now you're gonna take it off and let the plants survive in the, in the cold, hard world and they're not gonna like it. So you need to go gentle on them and give it a little bit of hardening off. So if you know that it's gonna be all the temperature we want for air in terms of it's not gonna freeze anymore by the beginning of next week, this week I'd start taking the ends off during the day. And at a certain point, I'd start rolling up the sides. So you're gradually hardening those plants off. That gives them a chance to toughen up the cuticle on their skin, on their leaf surface, so they don't lose as much water. Gives them a chance to get used to the wind so that they get a little bit of cellulose in the stem so they're not flopping back and forth. So there's a couple different things going on in the hardening off process that you need to do as you're taking off the cover of your raised bed, just the same way you would if you were bringing transplants home from the greenhouse and you want to put them outside. The same kind of concept is going on. You need to protect them a little bit, okay? Okay, real quickly, I see I'm talking too long. We're gonna go long here if I'm not careful. So there's a couple of areas, a couple of things that are what I would call individual protectors. So we have the hot cap, which is a marketed product. You can find it at any one of the garden centers. It's wax paper, um, about a dollar a piece. Um, they sell them, but you know, as I look at them, they seem a little bit small. They seem a little bit short. If I'm wanting to stick a tomato in there, and that looks like, I can't tell what that is, if that's a pepper. That could be a pepper there, I'm not sure, but that's a, obviously a new transplant. Um, but it's not gonna last very long in there. It's gonna be banging off the top of that. So you know, it's a possibility for you, gives you some localized protection, easy entry level into season extension, but I don't know how long it'll last for you. This is one of my favorites, wall of water. This is how I got started season extending. It's now called the season starter because the patent ran out or somebody else is making it. So now called the season starter. Circular tube, you can see a circle of circular tubes of water. You fill these tubes up with water and you've created a little greenhouse, 
around your plant, okay? Um, it's a microclimate, right? We've got sun coming through, we've got water warming up, the soil is being warmed, that water is going to hold some of that heat during the night, so you've created a nice little microclimate, nice little greenhouse there. These are more expensive, they're about five bucks a piece, um, and they last three to five years, the plastic starts to crack and then the water drains out. And you can buy a repair kit, of course, which is another plastic tube that you just slip inside of that one. Um, advantages, we talked about that a little bit. Um, warms the soil, plants are protected from wind and cold. Um, you can, and this is what I like to do is I combine with a short maturity hybrid just to see how early I can get my tomatoes to grow. So, you know, you know, try it, give it a shot, just, ex, you know, ex, uh, explore, experiment, see what happens. Disadvantages. They're not easy to fill. I mean, there's, a, there's a trick, but I have a trick. Um, the plastic does crack, which we explained. You get algae in the tubes, right? So they suggest you treat them with a little bit of bleach. Um, some even suggested put the bleach solution in the tubes, which I don't think I'd recommend because if you jostle that tube, the, the solution's going to jump out and then you've got bleach on your plants or in the soil. So, I mean, I would wash them perhaps at the end of every season, try to clean them out, but I wouldn't put bleach in them during the season. Um, light penetration is an issue. Um, they can get, the, the plants will start to stretch. Like we talked about with transplants here in this class in Lincoln, if you haven't got enough light, your plants will begin to stretch and they'll get leggy. Um, and because it's so nice in there, fungus will grow in there. You can get some early season blight on your tomatoes. So here's the wall of water trick. Uh, that's a five gallon drywall bucket with the bottom cut out. Um, put the wall of water around the bucket. And I usually plant my plant first. You can, you, I've seen it done two ways. Some people say, put the wall of water out there, fill it up and leave it be on the soil for a while and then go plant your plant in. Well, but it's a little bit hard to get that plant planted when that thing's full of water and you're trying to work down in there. So I've kind of just settled on letting the plant shock just a little bit, planting it and putting the wall or water around it right away. So, I mean, you try it and see what happens. Um, and here's a new thing I saw this year, um, replaces the plastic milk jug. Um, this was four bucks. Um, so you can see it's got a flap that you can close over the top, you can open it up if it gets hot, you hold it down with landscape pins, same concept, um, trying to keep soil moisture in, or sorry, soil heat in. Um, in. In another case of where science spoils the fun, there is a specific study done at Virginia Tech about the three things we just talked about, right? So these guys studied everything. They studied soil temperature, they studied air temperature, they studied date of first flower, weight of the first tomato. They pulled the plant out and weighed the tomato to determine how much it grew or didn't grow. And um, so they determined that it was only effective on sunny days. Things only warmed up on sunny days. Um, everything worked to raise the temperature. Um, temperatures declined faster in the milk jugs, which I don't understand why necessarily, followed by the hot caps in the wall of water. Um, wall of water did a better job of moderating the temperature, which makes sense because of all the water there. And they did get an earlier tomato with the wall of water. Um, but the plants were smaller, had poor pollination, um, the plants were thinner, this whole issue of light penetration, and the milk jugs didn't work at all. So, and at the end of your presentation, there's a, a paper. So there's a NEB guide that talks about this study, and then there's the actual paper I think I linked to the paper in there as well. If you know, if you really like your coffee in the morning, if it's a big coffee mug, you read the whole paper. All right, so cold frame. Um, this is a Wikipedia. They were my friend. So cold frames, cold uh, transparent roof structure, low to the ground, protect plants from adverse weather. A transparent roof admits the sunlight. It's a miniature greenhouse to extend the growing season. That's exactly what came out of the definition. Here are some pictures. So. You know, you can go with cold frames. I think they're a little bit more work than a, ra than a low tunnel on a raised bed. Not as effective. For my money, that's my opinion. And since I'm talking, I get to express my opinion. So you see, here's one that you can buy from a catalog. It opens up on both sides. You can even buy this with an automatic vent opener. So they'll, they have a, a wax that begins to expand at a certain temperature and that lid will just open right up when the inside temperature gets to a certain temperature. 
okay? Here's a guy that went to the eco store and found a whole bunch of old windows and made a cold frame. Okay, he's probably got a lid for it. Well, the right there. see how that. Um, here's nails in old windows. Looks like spinach in there. And this lady, I believe, has a book. She lives somewhere in the Northeast, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, something like that. And she's got a whole plan for how do you build the cold frame, when do you plant what in the cold frame, um, an extensive book. So cold frames are anything you want them to be. And I think all the same caveats apply, right? Sun's coming through those windows, it's going to get hot. Watch the temperature. New plants, make sure they have enough water. Um, have them in place, be ready with them when you know the soil is gonna to start to get cool so that you can retain as much soil heat as possible. Okay, hotbed. This is the last formal one here and I wanna warn you that if you go type in hotbed into Google to find out some more information, you better be careful. Because I was like, oh my goodness, that's not what I was looking for. Anyway. This is a special form of the cold frame, and I found it most commonly in blogs and um, web pages where someone was talking about sustainability or homesteading, where there was a much more um, integrated approach to gardening was a part of the bigger picture. And in this particular concept, they were using, they were building a compost pile under a cold frame. So they would allow the compost pile to start the heat. They lay some topsoil on top, put the cold frame on top, and all of that moisture from the compost pile is coming up into the cold frame to get it good and warm. Now there were some caveats about you know outgassing from the compost, ammonia, some things like that. So I mean, if you're going to do this type of thing, do a little bit of research. I have never used one of these hotbeds. I've seen them used. Um, I've also seen here's one with the cables underneath. So obviously you wouldn't have the issues with compost problems underneath. You wouldn't have to regenerate your compost pile. You wouldn't have to build your compost pile, but you'd have to buy the cables. So, you know, there's issues either way. Um, and then there's the one with the manure underneath. You can see they've made a manure pile. Uh, they put the loam on top, and then they probably put the stuff in the, uh, the plants on top of that. So only an introduction. I recognize that, but, um, something that I think probably takes a little bit more research, a little bit more complex than say a low tunnel or even a cold frame. So things to remember, um, and this applies to all of the techniques, all right? So your air temperature, you're gonna see variation in your air temperature, right? It's gonna go up during the day because that sun is magnifying through the plastic, through the glass, and it's gonna go, go down at night. Our challenge, of course, then is to try to keep as much of that as possible. Irrigation new seeds, new transplants, you're gonna to have to water because the sun's gonna dry out the soil. You're going to, it's gonna be very humid in there, but the soil could dry, especially with new plants. You're gonna to have to keep them moist. Um, light transmission, so you know, pay attention to your plants. Are they starting to stretch a little bit? If it's a warm day and you see that they're starting to stretch, you know, see if you can kind of peel back the edges and get them a little more sunlight. And at a certain point, you know, you'll be able to pull it off completely. And you know from your area, where you're comfortable and how much you want to gamble with your transplants. And then we talked about hardening off. If you're going to pull them from the cold frame or from the low tunnel into the cold, harsh world. So this is my more complex form of season extension. This is my greenhouse in my backyard um, that I built. I had to design a greenhouse for a class. So it's half shed, half greenhouse. Um, it's really just a glorified cold frame. Um, it's not insulated, it will be insulated, it's not heated, it won't be heated. Um, but uh, you know, some guys uh, buy Harley Davidsons and some guys buy a kegerator and a 20, 72 inch plasma television, put it in the garage. Some guys have affairs. I built a greenhouse, my wife always knows where I am. So you know, that's, this is my form of season extension. Um, so this is where you find me on uh, a sunny day in the greenhouse. Um, so what did we learn? We learned about we need to make a microclimate, right? We've got to control the flow of heat and we've got some tools to do that. We've got some techniques to do that. Um, we need to pick our seeds, pick our transplants in line with what we're trying to accomplish. Do I want to get everything done before it gets too hot? Do I want to go as long into the fall as possible? Do I want to get as early start as possible? You know, use the gardening catalogs, use your knowledge to pick the crops that work best for you. Plan. 
you know, have your stuff ready before it frosts. You know, um, now is a perfect time. You, you know, you should have ordered your seeds by now because there's going to be back ordered if you haven't ordered. So order your seeds. You know, what am I going to do? So the next sunny day, see if you can build, you know, a low tunnel. See if you can build something in the backyard that's going to give you a couple heads of lettuce or a couple rows of lettuce a little bit early. Challenge yourself, experiment, have some fun. Pick your technique, have some fun, uh, combine your techniques, uh, and enjoy. If we're not having fun, uh, you know, what are we doing? We should be doing something else, all right? So that's it for this evening. Any questions? Um, we have one here in Lincoln already, so did you have a yeah, question? Yeah. How did your uh, low tunnel stand up in the Oh, that's right. That was that question. So I have um, a very protected area. So I've got a six-foot privacy fence. Oh, sorry. Question was, how did I get my low tunnel to stand up in the wind? Um, so I've got a six-foot privacy fence, and I'm in an urban area that's got lots of mature trees. So it may be blowing and howling, and I would never know it in, in my yard. So, I mean, by nature, that round design is probably pretty good for the wind. What I would be concerned about would be making sure the edges are strapped down good and making sure you've got enough clips on your bows. I would say the wind is probably not going to take it out if you've got them in the ground well and you've got that support purling in. Um, make sure you've got it, the edges down because if the wind gets under there, it's a sailboat, right? And it's going to send it flying. So make sure you've got it clamped down and make sure you've got the edges down. So that would be the best recommendation. So we have some questions out state, um, okay. Tim. So the first one, and this is gonna refer back to your, your temperature chart. Yep. Um, on the temperatures, is that with um, a cover on them or is it exposed? Those are bare soil temperatures. The High Plains data, High Plains Regional Climate Center is bare soil temperatures. When you see a, a temperature either from CropWatch um, or from High Plains, it will say how it's measured, and both of those websites will show bare soil temperature. Uh, the the crop watch shot may uh, crop watch site may have. I think the far right column on that web page is under sod, so they've got two temperatures. They got bare soil and sod, and you'll see a little bit of difference. Um, but the ones I showed were bare soil. Um, so the next question is, is, is seven days, um, germination on the optimum temperature longer for the range? Um, it, it depends. I mean, that, that was a number I picked out of the air, um, just for, you know, the purposes of the exercise. I mean, each crop is going to be a little bit longer, right? So some of the, the cool season crops, if they're warm, they're going to pop out of the ground in a couple of days. Um, some things are going to take a little bit longer. Uh, so that, that I mean, that was a number that I picked just to be able to, to do the exercise with, but there's going to be some variation in each of those crops. I think seven days is a reasonable number for a good, for the majority of crops. It may be on the low end for some other crops. It depends on what it is. So and on the back of your seed packet, you're going to have it um, in the garden catalog. You're likely going to have it. That's one of the reasons I really like Johnny's catalog. I know we're not supposed to talk about brand names, but Johnny's catalog and territorial catalog both have in the beginning of each section of seeds. So like before the carrot section, before the bean section, before the lettuce section, you will see almost a half a page of cultivation information. So you will see soil temperature, optimum germination temperature, time to maturity, um, behavior, resistance to different blights, resistance to different things. So there's a lot of information in there besides the retail information. So, you know, I would encourage you if you have those catalogs to look in some of those as you're, as a, you're looking at some of the dates, you can gather a little bit of more information about gardening just by looking at the catalog, just by having the catalog. I don't know if that answered the question or not. Well, and, and I can just add to that. So just, um, I planted the microgreens in the greenhouse and they were sitting on, they were a brassicaceae family. So the cabbage family. Um, they were sitting on a 76 degree heat mat and they germinated in two days. Yeah. So if it's, if it's ideal for them, you know, they will germinate much quicker. 
So the next question is, is how do you water in the low tunnel? So that's the, you get down on your knees with one of those little sponge mats and your little watering can and you peel up the plastic and you stick your head in there and you water it. So it's pretty, it's a very manual operation. The low, I mean, that's the difference between the high tunnel and the low tunnel. The high tunnel, you walk into it. You know, you open the door and you walk in, you're standing up, you turn on the hose. In some cases, you turn on the hose and water. In the low tunnel, you've got a watering can, you've got to peel back the plastic. In my case, you saw I undo the clips, or roll, just roll the plastic up, clip it onto the bows, and I just reach in there and water it. So it's a manual, a manual operation. Um, later in the season, I suppose you could put some soaker hoses in there if you were wanted to transition to an uncovered raised bed that started as a low tunnel. It's entirely conceivable that you'd had a drip, you know, a drip hose, a soaker hose in there. Um, but I wouldn't think you would need that right now. Um, so. so the next question would is, is would you plant the mosh or the lamb's lettuce in a container? You, you certainly can. You certainly can. And I found out something this week that I mentioned a little bit earlier um, that it doesn't like the heat. And so I planted some of that mache in hanging pots that I hung on the inside of my greenhouse right here. I hang some hanging pots right here. And we had like two or three days of intense sunlight. And one of the ways that I could be off in the ditch here, but one of the ways I designed this greenhouse was that this angle right here is optimized for right now so that the sun is coming in directly at its most intense right now to warm up the soil as much as possible. So those water, those pots were hanging right there. And I think I essentially steamed my mache seeds. So I'm gonna have to start over. So you could hang them in pots, but I would keep them cool. Um, you, know, a, you know, a south facing window, you know, maybe not in direct sun, but a little bit out of the way, but certainly not, because I'm sure the soil temperature in those hanging pots with that sun coming through there was 80, 90 degrees, and I'm, I'm sure I cooked them. So I got to start over. So I learned that the hard way. But yes, they would grow in pots. I had the mache in pots as well as in the ground down here. So the next question is, how do you begin a raised bed on existing turf or ground? Can you just put newspaper down and then build on top? Um, if you're just using, if you're just starting with turf, I mean, you could do that, but you know, it's hard to know how compacted that turf is. So if you wanted to do that, I would, you know, plot out the size of your raised bed and I would at least take a, a garden spade, a garden shovel and turn over that turf within that square so that you've got that rough surface. You have an opportunity for water infiltration. You have a water opportunity for some organic matter infiltration if you are um, adding some compost and then you also don't have that artificial barrier from the compacted turf where roots are pushing down. They've got a little bit more place to go in. I mean, you could go whole hog and, and till it up before you put your raised bed on, but I think you'd probably be okay if you went down a depth of a shovel blade and just turned it over and broke it up nice. That's all the questions I have so far from here. Anything else here in Lincoln? All righty then, so uh, happy gardening. Have fun. Well, thanks, Tim. I want to thank you for doing that. Um, remember, next week will be our last um, online uh, class, which will be, um, uh, oh, landscape management. I guess I better remember that because I'm doing it. So I will see you all next week.